Good singing tonight. Good to see you out tonight. We are back tonight in our series that we've titled Being Baptist, Distinctives That Matter. Now, I have been asked, why in the world would we do a series called Being Baptist? Here's my answer to that question, because we're a Baptist church. Kind of makes sense, right? Uh, most people are whatever denomination they are. You've heard me say this before. They are whatever denomination they are out of convenience. They happened upon a church. They liked that church. They stayed in that church. That's called convenience, okay? Um, now, convenience is not necessarily a bad thing. There's something to be said about convenience. You know, when I walk to my faucet and I turn it on, and water comes out. That's a whole lot better than me than walking out to the well and pumping. And There's something to be said about convenience, you know. Uh, when you walk in in the room and just switch on a light and the power comes on. You know, that's a lot nicer than having to get a match and light a candle and then go light another candle. Convenience isn't necessarily bad, but when it comes to what church you belong to, it's not good. Okay? You should know why you are in the church you are in. You should know what the core tenets of belief are in the church you are in. Now, I've said already, and I've said this every week so far, we're, we're a Baptist church. I'm teaching on Baptist distinctives because I'm a Baptist pastor of a Baptist church. If I were a Presbyterian pastor of a Presbyterian church, I would probably preach a series of messages on what makes a Presbyterian a Presbyterian or Lutheran, or you add whatever title you want in there, because I think you should know that. So what makes a Baptist a Baptist? Now, just let me kind of back up by way of review. The Baptist denomination is a Christian denomination. There are beliefs out there that are core Christian beliefs, that without those beliefs, you're not even a Christian. And this is the place where denominational differences are set aside and we overlap. You see, much of Christianity, regardless of the denomination, has more in common than we don't have in common. So the fundamentals of the faith are the inspiration and infallibility of scriptures. You believe the Bible is God-breathed, God-preserved, God-inspired. That's a Christian belief. If you reject the inspiration and the infallibility of Scripture, you are not a Christian. You might call yourself a Christian, but you're not. Well, I can call myself a bodybuilder, but it ain't going to make me a bodybuiller. So if you reject the inspiration and inerrancy of Scripture, you're not a Christian. The other one is the deity and virgin birth of Christ. If you reject that belief, you're not a Christian. You shouldn't even call yourself one. If uh, the sufficiency of Christ's substitutionary atonement, meaning Christ's death, burial, resurrection was enough to bring about salvation. That is a fundamental Christian belief. If you reject the sufficiency of Christ's atonement, you are not a Christian. Now let me back up, because some of you, those, sp those spidey hairs on the back of your neck just tingled when I said that. If you add to salvation anything than the atonement of Christ, you are working opposite of Bible doctrine. Salvation is of Christ alone, plus nothing, minus nothing. I don't want to call out names, but Catholicism is kind of the place you go to there. They teach a works-based salvation. They teach Christ plus a system of works earns you merit that hopefully you store up enough merit to get to heaven. That is not a Christian belief. In fact, the reformers about 500 years ago, literally several of them gave their lives to rescue that doctrine. If you preach Christ plus baptism, that's not a Christian belief. You are adding to the doctrine of the Bible. And on and on it goes. Christ plus church membership, Christ plus communion, whatever it might be. Christ atonement's enough. That's a fundamental. The literal bodily resurrection of Christ. If you reject that, you're not a Christian. 
And finally, the literal bodily second coming of Christ. The belief that Christ will day return for his bride. Now, a lot of people argue over who his bride is. I, I'm headed to a conference this week. In fact, I'm preaching Wednesday morning in that conference. Pray for me. The good news is Wednesday night, the Southern Gospel Group Greater Vision is singing in that conference. So if I lay an egg Wednesday morning, everybody will forget about it by Thursday. So we're good. But uh, uh, I'm heading to a conference with some of my friends who, who actually will tell you the bride of Christ is the Baptist church. And everybody else is on the outside looking in. And when they get to heaven, they get a premium seat. That's nonsense. <laughs> All right? And don't worry, the friends I'm preaching with, I've looked them in the eye and told them that before. And they still invite me, so that's a good thing, but that's nonsense. Christ is returning for his bride. Who's his bride? All who are saved. The church. Yeah. Those are fundamentals of the Christian faith. That's, that's why I can have some fellowship with a Presbyterian pastor. That's why I can have fellowship with a, with a pastor in a brethren church. That's why I can have fellowship with, uh, with other Christian denominations. When I say fellowship, I mean Christian brotherhood. I mean, I, I can partner with them on some things. Why? Because we agree on that, that fundamental set of beliefs. That, that makes us Christian. Those beliefs do not make us Baptist. They make us Christians. But Baptists have a core set of beliefs a bundle of beliefs, if you will. Remember I said the bundle makes us Baptist? That, that we believe in, that we hold to, and not any one of those beliefs makes us Baptist. There are other groups who hold to those, some of those same beliefs, but not all of them collectively together. So that, that set of beliefs, that bundle of beliefs, is what makes us Baptist. For instance, the authority of Scripture, specifically the New Testament. That doesn't mean the Old Testament's not authoritative. It just means for the church, we get our marching orders, if you will, from the New Testament. Believer's baptism, uh, pure church membership, meaning you've actually got to be a Christian to be a member of the church, individual, uh, soul liberty, individual soul responsibility, Christian responsibility, congregational government, separation of church and state. That, that is what makes us Baptist. Now, through this course, we will eventually get to the point where we talk about and outline each one of those beliefs. And what do they mean? Perhaps you've seen the acrostic before where somebody spells out the word Baptist and then they list out to the side those, those things. And that's all well and good. It's great for memory. But the problem is it doesn't give you enough information. So we're going to go through those as we get down the road uh, and, and cover each one. In fact, starting next week, we're going to cover each one. What we do believe about the authority of Scripture. But... Before we cover those individual beliefs, last time we were together, we covered the idea of handling scriptural evidence. We arrive at our beliefs based on the way that we interpret the scriptures. You've heard me say before, it is the Bible that makes us Baptist. Now, does that mean those folks who are not Baptist don't believe the Bible? No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying the way we interpret the Bible is what leads us to our Baptist convictions. Now, we covered two of those. They're called hermeneutic principles, those principles of Bible study last week. We're going to review, two weeks ago, we're going to review those tonight, and then we're going to cover the third one before we move on to examining these one by one the next time we're together next Sunday night. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, though, to start off the sermon. Father... I pray your blessings now upon the teaching of your word as we go through it together and look about the principles with which we study your word. Help us to learn and grow by it. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. We looked last time we were together at the appeal for authority on faith and church order. Where do we run to for our authority and operation in the church? Where do we run to for church order, the how-tos, if you will. There are denominations out there who would point you to a, what is called a confession of faith. Now, confessions of faith are good things. They are men's words set out to describe, here's what we believe. 
But there are denominations out there, if you say, well, what do you believe about? They'll respond to you, well, the Westminster Confession of Faith says this. Well, the London Baptist Confession of Faith of 16-whatever, 89, I think, says this. Or they run you to a statement of faith and not to the Scripture. Now, those statements of faith have plenty of Scripture in them. But they're taking their authority not from the Scripture directly, but from a statement of faith. Baptists do not do that as a general rule of principle. That doesn't mean there aren't individual Baptist churches who may do that, okay? Here's the beauty of being Baptist. We're not all alike, and we're allowed to not all be alike. It's a beautiful thing. But as a general rule, Baptists do not run to a a statement of faith for authority uh, and church order. We run to the Scriptures. This is where we get all matters. It says It's worded this way in our church constitution, by the way, of faith and practice. We get it from the Word of God. So when somebody says to you, well, what does your church believe about? You, you, you don't go, well, hold on, let me go grab the confession of faith. You go, no, let me show you from the Scriptures. This is our authority right here. I can argue with a, with a confession of faith. I, I can argue all day with a confession of faith. It's hard to argue with what thus saith the Lord. It doesn't mean people don't try, but it's hard to argue with it. So if the Bible is our authority on faith and church order, then I must know how to rightly apply the Bible to my belief. I have to know how to do that. And so for Baptists, there are three general rules that we use for evaluating biblical evidence. I showed you this picture last week. Nope, oh, nope, oh, nope, oh, hold on, we'll get there. Don't you hate when the pastor gets busy preaching and forgets to click his PowerPoint? There we go. We showed you this picture last week. These are the three hermeneutic principles that we at Heritage Baptist Church, by the way, use to interpret Scripture. The first one is this. We interpret historical passages with teaching passages that are designed to instruct. So in other words, we, we, we take the Bible and we take historical passages. You know those places in the Bible that says they went and they did this. And then afterwards, they did this. And we take those historical narrative passages and we we don't draw our set of beliefs from those narrative passages. We draw from passages that are designed to instruct, that say, you do this, okay? I'll give you, for instance, in the early church, the church at Jerusalem, they actually took all their money and they combined it together in one giant pool, if you will, and then they handed that money out to everybody in the Jerusalem church to live off of. By the way, today we'd call that socialism. There are those who say, well, the Jerusalem church did this, therefore all churches should do this. The problem is nowhere in the Bible are we commanded to do that. Does it mean that we can't do that in the church? We can. There's nothing that says we can't. I'm not talking about government. I'm talking about church. There's nothing that says the members of Heritage Baptist Church, if they wanted to, could give all their money to the church, and then Miss Donna, on Monday morning, sits and writes checks out to every member of the church. Notice I said Miss Donna. I don't handle the money. She does. And I'm okay with that, by the way. You know what I like? I get a report that says, hey, this is what we got. It's all I need to know. But anyway, she would, if we wanted to do that, we could. There's nothing in the Bible that says we can't. But there's nothing in the Bible that says we have to either. So you can read those stories and go, well, they did it that way. That means we have to do it that way. No, we don't. We interpret those historical passages with teaching passages that are designed to instruct. Those passages that say, hey, in the church, you do this. So that's our first hermeneutic principle of Bible interpretation. I'll give you another one in Acts chapter 6. They, they supported 
financially and with food, the widows in their church. They daily gave them food. If they had no family, they went to the church for their food. They did that in the Jerusalem church. Does that therefore mean that all churches need to do that? No. What if a church doesn't have widows? What are they supposed to do then? Well, they're supposed to go find somebody. No. Just because they did it doesn't mean we have to do it. You have to understand genre when you read the Bible. If it's narrative, it's not prescriptive necessarily, okay? So that's rule one. We interpret historical passages with teaching passages that are designed to instruct. That is an important rule because if you don't do that, you will come up with all kinds of wonky forms of doctrine. And people do come up with all kinds of wonky forms of doctrine because they take something that's not meant for them and they apply it somewhere else. You have to apply the Bible correctly. Then we looked at the second uh, principle of evaluating biblical evidence, and we saw that it was this. Clear passages should interpret obscure passages. We interpret obscure passages with clear passages that can only mean one thing. There are those weird verses in the Bible that guys like me like to sit around with other guys like me and debate about all day long what they mean because they're only mentioned once in the Bible? What do we do with those? Last time we were together, we went to 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 29, where Paul says something about baptism for the dead. One verse, the only place in the Bible where it's mentioned, baptism for the dead. What do we do with that? Well, there's a certain belief system out there. The Mormons have taken that one verse and they've constructed a whole belief around it that says you can get baptized for your dead Aunt Sally if you want to, so dead Aunt Sally can go to heaven. And they've built a whole belief system around one verse in the Bible that is only mentioned in one place and one time. Now, what does that verse, what is baptism for the dead? I don't know. And neither does any scholar out there who claims they know for sure. It was probably some cultural thing that went on in Corinth that the church at Corinth knew exactly what Paul was talking about. Because they did it that way in Corinth. They did that one thing. It, it was probably a cultural belief. And they went, oh yeah, we know what Paul's talking about there, but we don't. So what do we do with it? Well, we take those obscure passages and we compare them to clear passages that can only mean one thing. And on and on it goes. I'll give you a for instance. There are those who teach that in order to be saved, you have to work out your own salvation. The Bible says that, work out your own salvation. And they'll go, hey, look at that. So you've got to work to go to heaven, okay? There's, that only says it one place in Scripture. But the Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And over and over and over and over again in the New Testament, you find it taught that you cannot work your way to heaven. So what do I do with that one verse that says, work out your salvation? Well, no, right there, I got to work. No, I take that obscure verse and I interpret it with all the clear verses that can only mean one thing. Now, there are other verses of the Bible that really have no bearing on belief, but it, it could mean this, it, it could mean that, it, it could mean this thing over here, and it could mean another thing. What do we do with those? What we describe them for what they are? There are various views about this belief. But listen, there's no major doctrine we view like that. We interpret obscure passages with clear passages that can only mean one thing. If it doesn't mean one thing, we don't build a Bible doctrine around it. That's how you get false doctrine. I mentioned that I'm headed to a conference this week with my friends who believe that Baptists are the only ones in the bride of Christ. Such a prideful, arrogant doctrine, by the way, but, but they, they believe that. Do you know where they get that from? One verse in the book of John where John the Baptist calls himself a friend. He says that he's not the bridegroom, but he is the friend of the bride. One verse. And they've built a doctrine around 
one phrase in one verse that's mentioned only once in Scripture. They built an entire doctrinal belief around it. Now, it astounds me because these are guys who preach the Bible. They're expositional preachers. They're wonderful men of God who preach the Bible. And yet that one thing, they built this whole set of belief around. Now, does it really matter much? No. Does it affect doctrine? No. But they've built a whole wonky set of belief. Why? Because they've taken an obscure verse and they've built a belief system around it. Instead of looking at that obscure verse and setting it off to the side and go, that's obscure, here's all the rest of the passages that are clear on who the bride of Christ is. You've got to be careful with that. That brings us, there's all the review, that was free. Now let's get to what we're studying tonight. Here's our third view of biblical interpretation. And it is this. Deliberate passages should interpret incidental passages. We interpret incidental passages with deliberate passages that answer questions directly. Now that, that's a lot of words. I'm going to explain to you what we mean. We interpret incidental passages with deliberate passages that answer questions directly. The principle here is that the Bible speaks more clearly and directly when it is trying to answer a specific question than when it is talking about a different topic. You see, if we can find a passage that actually aims to answer the question that we're asking, that passage will be of greater value to us than a whole list of passages that just touch on our question incidentally. By the way, this gets to how we should preach. Around here we do something, now tonight's a little bit more topical, I, I understand, but we do something that's called expositional preaching. That's where we take a passage of scripture, it may be a verse, it may be a paragraph, it may be a whole chapter, whatever, and we, we unpack that verse of scripture. Now, I like going through books of the Bible. By the way, going through books of the Bible is one form of expositional preaching that is not all there is of expositional preaching, okay? I like going through books of the Bible because you build on topics and themes. And, but when you're going verse by verse through that, there are things I have found that I've preached whole sermons on that if I were just looking for something randomly to preach in the Bible, I wouldn't have preached on that. If I'm randomly looking for a topic to preach, man, there are easy ones to go to. Who doesn't want to preach on heaven? Let's preach on that every week. Salvation, that's an easy one. Inerrancy of Scripture, there's a good one to preach. I'd have a list of about, I don't know, maybe seven, eight, maybe ten things, and I'd just randomly hit each topic every week as we went, but I'd basically only preach ten sermons in, in a hundred different ways. That's called topical preaching. That's easy to do. But man, when you're going verse by verse, and the Bible talks about one of those really hard things, and you're going, well, that's, that's where I'm at, so I've got to preach that. I've got to endeavor to find out what that is. And then I'm feeding you things you didn't even know you needed, and yet you needed them, and you're growing spiritually. It's the Bible equivalent to feeding your baby peas, even though they might not like them. <laughs> That's the beauty of, of preaching and studying the Bible. And the Bible answers things more clearly when you study and read and preach and teach the Bible that way than if you just go through looking for topics. Let me illustrate that for you. Let's say we want to understand about baptism, and, and baptism in water specifically. Now, the Bible talks about the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and it talks about the water baptism, but let's say we wanted to do a search on baptism. Then we need to go to the Bible and find passages that aim to teach us about water baptism. Now, we may be interested in passages that mention baptism, even when they're not aiming to teach us about it, but we can't base our doctrine on those passages. Let me give you, for instance, I knew you were wondering when we were going to get into the Bible tonight. Take your Bibles, Acts 22 and verse number 16. Acts 22 and verse number 16. So there are two forms. I, I want to know about baptism. So I get out a topical Bible, or I get out a Strong's Concordance, that's one of those really big thick books, or here's actually the, the, more, the quicker route to do in our day and age, I go to Google, and I type in 
baptism. And instantly, every verse in the Bible that has the word baptism in it, or baptize, or some form of the word. And then I just start going, hmm, oh, look at that, look at that, look at that. The problem is, just because it mentions that word doesn't necessarily mean it's talking about water baptism. Do you understand what I'm going for here? Here's one of the verses you would get, Acts 22 and verse 16. Here the word of God says this, and now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. What wrong conclusions might you draw if we based our doctrine of baptism on this one verse? Help me out tonight. What would you draw from? Got to be baptized to wash away your sins. By the way, there are denominations who teach that very thing. Got to be baptized in order to wash away your sins your sins. Now, we wouldn't want to base any conclusion upon references that may not be associated with baptism. For instance, in the Bible, we'll read phrases like washing of regeneration in Titus 3.5. We'll read passages in John 3.5 where Jesus says you must be born of water. What was he talking about? Well, John 3 is talking to Nicodemus. Born of water means a physical birth. <laughs> And then he talks about spiritual birth, being reborn. But if I just cherry pick the one verse that says born of water, I could build a whole doctrine around it that says, see, in order to be saved, you've got to be baptized. And then I could cherry pick Acts twenty two sixteen and go, see, right here it says it again. But the problem when you do that, that's called proof texting. And proof texting can get you in a lot of problems. Now in Acts twenty two sixteen. Paul was not telling them that baptism washes away their sins. In the early church, baptism was very public. They didn't have heated indoor baptistry sunken in the floor like we do. Now, you got baptized in, in public. Wherever there was water, everybody could see you. And so to everybody, baptism was, was immediately associated with salvation. Oh, they must have came to Jesus. They're out there getting baptized like those Christians do. And so for the world around it, they'd say, well, they're baptized, so they must believe in Jesus. The world associated that very public thing with salvation. And so often in the book of Acts, you see salvation and baptism listed together. But is the Bible teaching, is this passage teaching that you get saved by, by baptism? No, it's teaching about salvation. You have to read the Bible in context. Read the whole chapter. Find out what the whole chapter is teaching. But when I just cherry pick from here and I cherry pick from here and I cherry pick from here, that's how we wind up with false doctrine. That is an inappropriate way of handling Scripture. So instead, if I want to find out about baptism, I don't just do a word search to find out everywhere that word is mentioned and then look at all those singular, singular verses. I have a big book on my bookshelf in there. It's called Strong's Concordance, and it's about that thick. Strong, a long time ago, was a very patient man, and he looked up every time the Bible mentioned a word, and he recorded those verses, just single verses. So, you want to know how many times the word and appears in the Bible? Well, Strong went and figured that out for you. It's about that much of the book. <laughs> Literally. The English Bible. He went through. And so you can go through and look up everywhere. So you can do that with baptism. And look up every single verse the word baptism appears in. But the problem is everywhere the word baptism is used isn't always talking about water baptism. So if that's all you do, and then you build your belief around that, that leads you to errant theology. And bad theology isn't good. So if I wanted to study the topic of baptism, what's the better way of doing it? Do I just look at individual verses that have the word baptize it? No. I go to passages of the Bible that clearly teach about baptism. And I study those entire passages out. And then I build my doctrine based on it. Are you with me so far? Now, if I were studying salvation, 
then I would study Titus 3, 5, where it talks about the washing of regeneration because that's talking about what the blood of Christ does at salvation. It washes your sins away. That's not baptism. But I would study that if I were studying salvation. Why? Because that whole passage is about salvation. So I take whole passages of Scripture that answer questions, and then I build my doctrine off of that. Understand tonight, there are no shortcuts to clarifying and applying our method of Bible interpretation. There are no shortcuts to the Word of God. None. It takes work. We can't demonstrate the truth of our doctrine and our practice simply by listing Scripture references. And that's often what we do. Well, I believe this, and here's a verse, 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 and here's a verse. That's called proof texting. And proof texting will get you in trouble. I told you last week the joke about the man who closed his Bible. He wanted to find a, a word from the Lord, and he randomly let his Bible fall open, and he closed his eyes, and he pointed to a verse on the page, and he opened his eyes, and he read it, and it said Judas went out and hanged himself, and he thought, well, that wasn't what I was looking for. So he closed his Bible, and he went through the whole process again, landed on the next verse, and it said, go and do thou likewise. <laughs> That's what proof texting will lead you to. <laughs> it get you in trouble every time. I once heard a pastor when I was in college, Bible college, preach a whole sermon for one verse in first or second kings i think it was that says quit you like men in the king james it says quit you like men and he preached a whole sermon fabulous sermon about how real men don't quit it's a great sermon the problem is the text he used wasn't about that at all <laughs> quit you like men means act like a man but he preached a whole sermon about not quitting you know what he did he proof texted and get you in trouble. Proof texting always leads to problems. No, we must demonstrate how the scriptures answer the questions that we are asking. And that's what we're going to attempt to do. Over the next coming weeks, as we look at every single one of our Baptist distinctives, one by one, we're going to go to whole passages of Scripture. We're going to study out chapters together and say, this is where our belief comes from. And then we're going to take those chapters and we're going to add them to other chapters. And we're going to add those to other chapters. And we're going to systematically study what we believe through the Bible, comparing Scripture with Scripture, chapter with chapter, verse by verse. As my pastor used to say, line upon line, precept upon precept. That's how we build Bible doctrine. Not what does the Bible say in one place, what does it say all over the place? See, isolated verses can be twisted to support what the rest of the Bible doesn't teach. But whole chapters, you can't do that with. Take your Bible, 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. That was all introduction, by the way. Here's the meat of the sermon. 2 Timothy chapter 2. I only preached for like 35 minutes this morning, okay? So I've got to make up for that. I'm kidding. 2 Timothy chapter 2. I got one courtesy laugh, and that was a nervous laugh. <laughs> he might be serious. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Look at verse 14. Paul's writing to Timothy here about approved and disapproved workers. Verse 14, remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit to the ruin of hearers. Don't argue about vain things. Verse 15, study to present yourselves approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, if you're not using a King James tonight, you might be shaking your head on that. I'm, I'm going to come back to it, okay? Verse 16, but shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness, and their message will spread like cancer. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past, and, have, and they overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands. Having this seal, the Lord knows who are His, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. 
But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also wood and clay, some of honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified and useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Flee also youthful lust, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But avoid foolish and, and ignorant disputes, knowing they generate strife. That verse just threw out every Facebook chat room on theology there is. Avoid them. Verse 24, and a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, apt to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Paul here is writing to Timothy, here is what an approved worker of Christ does. And then he illustrates what unapproved workers does to the fact that he actually names two of them who were spreading false doctrine. By the way, it's okay to name those who spread false doctrine. Paul does it in Scripture. Pastor, it's not nice to call out that guy on TV that I like. It's not nice of you to mention his name. That's not very Christian. Really, Paul did it. And like this was like 2,000 years ago, and we still know these guys' names. It's okay if they're spreading falsehood. He says, don't be like these guys. Here's what they do. Here's what a, an approved worker, minister, pastor, preacher for Christ does. God is the one who gives the approval. And only those who rightly divide the word of truth are approved workers. Now, to rightly divide Scripture means to cut it straight. It's literally what it means. Rightly divide. Cut it straight. We are not to twist or bend verses to mean something they don't mean. We're to cut the word of God straight. Now, why would Paul have, have said it that way? Cut it straight, Timothy. Paul was a tent maker by trade. He was a preacher. He was an apostle. But he earned his living by making tents. And perhaps when he wrote this, he had in mind the need to cut the animal skins in a straight line in order to butt them up against each other for a perfect seam. Those of you who sew, when you're sewing two pieces of fabric together, they've got to be cut, both of them straight, both of them just right in order. My wife quilts, and I've seen her do this, cut, cut a piece of fabric this way and cut another piece of fabric the same because she's going to bind them. I really have no idea what she's doing. But, so she's going to sew them together. That's what it looks like. But she wants them to match up. And then you get a nice seam. No doubt, that's, that's the imagery Paul was using here. Cut it straight, Timothy. You got to cut it straight because when you butt it up against other portions of the scripture, they've got to mesh together. That's how the preacher is to be when he's preaching God's word. God's workman is to cut straight when he's handling God's word. He can't cut a little over here and cut a little over here and cut a little over here and then try to shove it together and make it match up. You know what happens when you try to do that with a quilt? It's not going to work. You're going to have a pretty wonky looking blanket when you're done. But when you cut it right and you line everything up right and then you sew it all together, you get a nice patchwork. That's how the Word of God is. Cut it straight. Line it up just right. Weave it together to where it makes sense and it has an order and it has a direction to it. The man of God, the Christian, not just the pastor, the Christian is to interpret the Bible correctly. Realizing its teachings and comparing scripture with scripture until it forms a harmonious whole. That's how you study the Bible. If you read one verse of scripture, and you go, huh, I never realized that before. I think I'm going to believe that from now on. And it's a weird, wonky thing that nobody else ever believes. Listen, that's how you wind up with heresy. But you... Take Scripture, and you compare it with Scripture, and you compare it with Scripture, and you compare it with Scripture, and in the end, 
you wind up with a harmonious view of what God wants you to know. Look at chapter 2, verse 15. The King James says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. When you read that word study, what picture does it conjure up in your mind? What, what kind of effort should we give in studying the Bible? Someone says the word study. What comes to mind? Man, you're surrounded by books, right? If you actually studied when you went to school, you're surrounded by books. Nowadays, you've got your laptop out or your tablet, perhaps both. Sometimes in, in Bible study, I use my desktop, my laptop, and my tablet all simultaneously, all open to different things. And you're surrounded, right? You're, you're deep in study and you're sitting in a library somewhere. That's what comes to mind, right? That we should do our utmost to understand the topic and then apply it correctly. So when Paul says study, he's telling us we do our utmost to understand and apply the Bible correctly. Now, the word study actually means to have diligence, or to give haste. It doesn't mean, Timothy, surround yourself by a bunch of thick books in a quiet room and read every one of them until you come to the correct belief. That's what we think of when we think of the word study. But that's not what the word means. It literally means be diligent, give haste, show eagerness. In fact, the New King James says be diligent. It has been interpreted by the translators as study or diligence because the context is of handling the Word of God. We have to study the Bible with diligence, eagerness, and willingness. Not haphazardly, but with diligence, with effort. Find out what it says. Paul tells Timothy in verse 16 and 18, to shun false doctrine. Shun it. How do I respond to false doctrine? Paul said, Timothy, call it out for what it is and then shun it. Put it out from the church. Do away with it because it hurts people. Verse 24 and verse 26, he tells him why. Why do you do this, Timothy? In a hope that those who believe false doctrine will come to their senses and repent. That's what you do with false doctrine. You call it out for what it is. You show from the word of God why it's wrong. And you tell those people, you can't be a part of us. Why do we push them out? In order to repent and come to their senses and understand what the Bible says. The ultimate purpose in instructing those who oppose the word of God to embarrass them. It's not just to prove them wrong. Those might be steps in the process, but that's not why we do that. Why do we do it? We want them, the goal is they might repent and come to know the truth. It is the love of God's truth that must drive God's servant to study and defend the word of God. God's servants desire that the person opposing the truth come to the view of of the truth with the same love. When I stand up here and I call out a false doctrine and I name, I, I name somebody who believes that doctrine, what am I doing? Am I trying to put my finger in their eye? No. I hope they come to the realization of the truth. When you hear preachers get up and they call out guys like Joel Osteen for their false doctrine and heresy that they spread, why are they doing that? They're hoping that one day the truth of the right doctrine will come to that person. Anybody been stepped looking at Benny Hinn recently? Benny Hinn's nephew got saved. He's a preacher now. Regularly calls out false doctrine and calls out his father, his uncle's ministry. But here's the thing. If you study that ministry, Benny Hinn has come out some things and he's denounced some beliefs he used to have. What's happening? I don't know. From a distance, I don't know the guy. From a distance, it looks like those people constantly calling out his beliefs lovingly with scripture in hand are starting to drive them to the correct thing. Now, I don't know if that will happen. I pray it does. Lord knows he's led a lot of people down a false path. But that's
that's the goal. I want people to come to the realization of the true So these three rules, when we apply them to the handling of Scripture throughout our study of Baptist distinctives, these will lead us to our beliefs. When we weigh biblical evidence, some evidence weighs more than others. Teaching passages way more than historical passages. Passages that can only mean one thing way more than passages that could mean multiple things. Deliberate passages way more than incidental passages. So as we study out the Baptist distinctives, we're actually going to come back to these three principles. And you're going to hear me call out along the way. We come to this belief by applying this principle to Scripture. And they lead us to our distinctives. Our Baptist distinctives arise from the text of the Bible. And we're going to discover what those beliefs are. So if you came tonight hoping to find out what a Baptist is, that actually starts next week. Tonight, and last time we were together, we studied how do we arrive at what we believe through the careful handling of Scripture. Divide it right. Study it out. Piece it together. Listen, if you come to a conclusion that nobody else has ever come to in the history of studying the Bible, you're doing it wrong. teachers, because you're going to stand before God. Now be careful to study it. Be careful to know it. Apply it correctly. And when you do, your doctrine and your practice become biblical. And I'm a Baptist, because I believe my doctrine and my practice comes from the Word of God. And that's what arrives me in my conclusion. So, uh, would you stand here? See you.